Hello, I'm Jonathan Markley. I am a chairman of anesthesia for the East Orange General Hospital, and today I'm going to be discussing inpatient pain management, evidence-based solutions during an opioid epidemic. I serve as the hospital's opioid stewardship committee chair, which is an initiative by the Joint Commission to have a leadership team responsible for pain management and safe uh, opioid practices. So I'm an anesthesiologist and uh, frequently have risk discussions with patients prior to proceeding while getting the informed consent. And um, sometimes a patient will ask me, hey, what's my risk of dying or aspiration? And I'll say, well, this is elective surgery. You're a healthy ASA-1 patient. The risk of you dying during elective outpatient surgery may be 1 in 300,000, an extremely rare number. So when I came across some data that showed the 6% incidence of this serious adverse event, I was really amazed. So what serious adverse event occurs after surgery with a 6% incidence? It's that an opioid naive patient will become a chronic opioid user. So let's let that sink in for a minute. We have 20 patients for knee arthroscopy. One of them will become a chronic opioid user after that day. So this was based off of a large study in JAMA. It was a retrospective look at 36,000 patients. And what was amazing was that 80% of the procedures were minor procedures. So picture your knee arthroscopy. Picture your inguinal hernia, hernia repair. Picture a uh, kidney stone laser. These are minor procedures. So we take an opioid-naive patient, and after that intervention, there is a 1 in 20 chance, greater than 1 in 20 chance, that they'll be on opioids at the 90-day mark. And the truth is... When you're on opioids at the 90-day mark, there's a high likelihood it could be for life. And even higher risk were patients with depression, anxiety, tobacco, alcoholism, um, substance abuse disorders, or a preoperative pain disorder. So basically how I like to explain it is um, you take 20 patients and you give Percocet. Well, maybe 19 of them don't like it. They don't ever want to see it again. It made them groggy. It made them nauseous. But 1 in 20, it will give them an escape from the current mental illness that they have, maybe the anxiety, maybe the depression, maybe the pain, and they'll be exposed and then seek that medication out in the future, becoming a long-term opioid user. So what they did find was that the longer the initial exposure of opioids, the more likely that the patient was on opioids at the one-year mark. So we really want to minimize our initial opioid prescription for example, for an acute pain illness, we want three days of opioid. And we want to tell the patient to only utilize the opioid if their pain is severe. If the pain is a 4 out of 10, don't take the opioid. If it's a 7 out of 10, it may be reasonable to take one along with your Advil and your Tylenol. But we want to get away from writing larger prescriptions. So the goal of this slide is to show that what we're currently doing is not working. So the United States comprises less than 5% of the world's population, yet we utilize 99% of the world's hydrocodone, 80% of its oxycodone, 60% of its morphine. So what does this tell us? Is that we know something better than the rest of the world? No, I think it shows us that we made a major mistake. So this is a uh, representation of national drug overdose deaths in just the past 20 years. And you can see the rapid expansion of deaths from 1999 to 2019. So in 2019, there were 70,630 deaths. And to put that into perspective, there were 58,000 U.S. soldier deaths in the entire multi-year Vietnam War conflict. So every year, we're having greater number of deaths than U.S. soldiers that died in the Vietnam War. So of this 70,000 drug overdose deaths. Some of them were methamphetamine and cocaine and benzodiazepines, but 70% of this 70,000 deaths were involving an opioid. Now, heroin is also just drastically increasing. Now, let's look back to 1999. We had 2,000 deaths. That's nothing to shrug your shoulders at. That's a World Trade Center uh, amount of deaths, uh, which was a tragic occurrence in our history. 
but it has just gone up and up and up. And I want you to take notice of the heroin and other synthetic narcotic uh, contribution to the deaths. So heroin is now laced with synthetic opioids because the drug cartels realize that it's much easier to make a suitcase full of carbifentanyl or fentanyl rather than a semi-tractor trailer truck full of heroin. So what they do is they lace the uh, heroin with fentanyl and allow it to be much more potent, but this leads to many more overdose deaths. You know, picture me in the operating room as an anesthesiologist drawing up fentanyl in a 3cc syringe down to the nearest microgram, giving a dose and then knowing the pharmacokinetics, watching for a peak brain equilibration time of 5.4 minutes later, and then looking at the respiratory rate and tidal CO2 level of sedation. Well, that's not what happens out in recreational drug use. Truth is, a non-medical person will put the fentanyl on the heroin and give it out to be used in a random dose. And this is why we're seeing this rapid rise in deaths. And the cartels now have bought drug presses, and they will press pills that are labeled Xanax or Ativan, and they will actually be fentanyl. A very dangerous time. Okay, so you know we know what happened. We know the number of deaths we're happen, having, having, but our patients don't know it. And so it's time for us to be the parents in the room. Why do we give? Why are we given the right to prescribe a medication? Why are they not just over the counter? We're given the right to prescribe the medication because we are supposed to understand the data, understand the risk and prescribe appropriately. So let's look at this chart of dopamine levels in the brain. So picture the most beautiful succulent meal you've ever had at your favorite restaurant and that dopamine spike you get in the pleasure centers of your brain. Now look at opioids. Tremendously higher amount of dopamine spikes, tremendous more pleasure. So you think our patients are gonna seek out opioids? Yes, but I'm gonna show you a study a prospective randomized trial with two groups of people with pain. One group got opioids and one group did not. The group that got opioids at the one year mark were more disabled, less likely to return to work, and had higher pain scores. The group on usual care, which is like physical therapy and heat and icy hot and ibuprofen and Advil, they had better return to work, less disability, and less pain. So if we know that our patients will be worse off at the one-year mark. We have to convey that data to them, that chronic pain does not do well with opioids. Another eye-opening statistic is 80% of the heroin addicts that you've seen first got their prescription opioids misused before their heroin exposure. So truth is, is heroin is cheap. Prescription opioids are hard to get and expensive. And so 8 out of 10 heroin addicts in this nation, which there are 1 million of, first misuse prescription opioids. And the truth is that 1 in 3 of your patients are going to misuse the prescription that you give them. This is a representation showing you that in some states, there are more opioid prescriptions than there are people. So per 100 people, in some areas, there's 143 prescriptions per 100 people. So what happened? Well, it was really the perfect storm. The major players in the opioid crisis are some data that came out. Uh, there was a guy named Portnoy who published a small trial that showed that if you treated pain, that you would not get addiction. But in retrospect, looking at it, it was really only 38 patients. But the American Pain Society got on board and the Veterans Administration, the veteran, uh, the VA hospitals got on board and Joint Commission made pain the fifth vital sign. They penalized you if you didn't have the appropriate pathway to manage the pain. And then our insurance companies, you know, um, my wife goes to physical therapy and every visit I have to pay $70 even though we met our deductible. But an oxycodone prescription, which we haven't done, would be a dollar. $4. So what is that telling a patient with limited means? And then we have the big pharma. So Purdue Pharma have their commercial triumph, public health tragedy. Did you know that Purdue Pharma gave a starter coupon for OxyContin 
for a free 7 to 30 day trial and 34,000 coupons were redeemed. Now a lab rat will hit a lever to get oxycodone and show dependence after the fourth dose. So if this drug company is giving out 34,000 free month prescriptions, what is that going to do to those families? And they were teaching their their pharmacy representatives that there was to claim to the family physicians and the interns that there is a less than 1% risk of addiction, which is false. <clears throat> All right, now I have a pendulum shown here. And you can see in the um, 90s, the pendulum was all the way to one side where it was opioids for everything. And then maybe a few years ago, it swung too far to the right and it was opioids for nothing. But maybe we need to be more just off a of center, more towards the right. Because what happens is there's unintended consequences for just taking the opioid away from everyone who is addicted. It, addicted means that you you need to increase your dose. It means that you will withdraw without it, that in light of harms, you'll continue it. So if we just take away the medication, the patients are going to withdraw, and then they're going to have to make a decision. I'm withdrawing. I'm having pain. I'm nauseous. I don't feel right. I need an opioid. Am I going to go pay $80 for a pill on the street, or am I going to pay $20 for a bag of heroin? And then another in unintended consequence was that the pharmacology company said, oh, let's make our pills unable to be crushed and shot as heroin. That's a good thing. Well, the unintended consequence is you can't crush OxyContin and shoot it now, and you have to turn to heroin. So... Um, there's a lot of reasons that heroin is on the rise, but um, the cost of these um, prescription opioids is going to make heroin a better alternative. And so here's that look. It's from JAMA. It's within three years. It's a prospective trial, so there's less likely to have co-founding variables and selection bias. And basically, it showed that long-term opioid therapy is associated with poor pain outcomes, greater functional impairment, and lower return to work rates. All right, so that's that's showing you what the problem is, but let's talk about solutions. What can we do from here? So our goal for inpatient pain management is to minimize our opioid consumption, but also have good pain control. So we want to minimize the dependence and nausea, obstructive sleep apnea. So what is obstructive sleep apnea? Well, one in four men, one in 10 women, when they sleep, they have what's called hypopneas or apneas. Hypopnea, reduced flow, or apnea, obstructed flow. And it's a phenomenon where during sleep, you don't get great airflow and you have to wake up. So we call that the AHI, the, uh, the apnea hypopnea index. How many times in one hour do you have an apnea or hypopnea? And you'll see on a severe sleep apnea patient that they'll have 60 per hour. So let's say someone is at home and they're having 60 events per hour. And then they come to the hospital for a kidney stone, and we give them a milligram of dilaudid. That 60 per hour might ultimately become a sentinel event. And so our goal is to really optimize opioid dosage and administration so we don't overdose and cause a sentinel event in someone's father, someone's brother, someone's uncle. Also, by minimizing opioid consumption and dose, we can prevent the dose-related side effects like delirium, dizziness, disability, constipation, immobility. All right, so let's look at pain. Pain can be combated at so many levels. We have our noxious stimuli, which there's transduction to make that into a pain signal. It goes into the nerve and goes in the dorsal root to the lamina of the spinal cord, crosses over, goes up the spinal thalamic tract, hits the thalamus, and then goes all over the place. Somatosensory cortex, the limbic system. Then there's descending modulation, where you have inhibitory pathways to prevent overreaction pain. Well, opioids messes all this up. Opioids causes central sensitization, wind-up phenomenon for pain signals, where um, ion channels are left open and, and, and there's more trans transmission of signals. There's changes in, the, in descending modulation. There's decreased production of endogenous endorphins and kephalins. And all of this ultimately leads to the chronicity of opioid tolerance. All right, so I'm here now to present um, an option for you. It's called the EOGH Inpatient Pain Management Protocol. 
And what it does is it addresses pain from multiple areas. It doesn't just focus on the mu receptor in the opioid, but instead it works on the tissue level, on the neurons, on the brain. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through this pathway to try to present uh, how we can give effective but safe pain management. Now, um, a protocol, I never liked protocols because one size does not fit all. Your weekend warrior type who's in great shape should not get the same dose of opioid or even Advil as your frail elderly 45 kilogram grandmother. So this inpatient pain management uh, pain management protocol can be used by any clinician. All you do is hit add order, type the word EOGH or pain. You'll see the order set. You can set it as your favorite at that time. And it will offer a wide selection of scheduled, right? So scheduled means that it's not PRN, that the Tylenol, that the Ketorolac or Ibuprofen or Celebrex, um, that the Neurontin, whatever it is, is going to be given no matter what to keep a steady plasma state in the goal to minimize the opioid consumption. We want the patient not to have to ask for the opioid because their pain is managed well by the other agents. So basically, you click on the order set and you will choose a patient risk category. So you will choose a checkbox that says normal risk, frail, OSA at risk, or dialysis patient. And that will open an order set of the correct medications, the correct doses, and the correct intervals for your patient of that risk category. So here's our normal risk patient, the weekend warrior type, no comorbidities, normal creatinine, normal liver, good body weight, good reticular formation or alertness, normal risk. We have the potential intertrochanteric hip fracture in an underweight individual, elderly with some mild dementia type um, picture. That would be the frail category. The OSA at risk is the stop bang over three. So we do a stop bang score, which I'll show you in a second. And if the patient's at risk for obstructive sleep apnea, you choose that risk category and you'll be given a set of medications that are not going to give too high of a dose of opioids, that the interval between doses is going to be appropriate, that the nurse is going to be told to watch for advancing levels of sedations and apneas and hypopneas, that you will focus on the non-steroidals and the topicals and the non-pharmacologic strategies. So uh, real quick for the stop bang, that's how we screen for sleep apnea. Do you snore loud? Are you tired during the day? Anyone observe you having apneic events? Do you have hypertension, BMI over 35, age over 50, a neck circumference that's large, or you're a male? If you have three of these, then maybe don't give them the dose that you'd give the guy who doesn't have three of those. And so that is basically what the OSA at risk category stands for. And then the reduced creatinine and clearance is important because as a clinician, we want to be able to get our orders in and get the patient effectively treated, but we don't want to have to look everything up each time. Hey. Oh, it's a dialysis patient. Can I use Neurontin? How much Neurontin can I use? How frequently should I give it? Can I use Toradol? The answer is no, by the way. Can I use Advil? The answer is yeah. Um, can I use OxyContin? Can I use oh, Oxycodone? So this order set, when you click on the dialysis risk category, you'll get the medicines that are okay for those patients. So here's an overview. I'm going to kind of go through each section. Um, first, we have our alternative to opioid medications are auto medications. So on a multimodal approach, we don't just go after the opioid receptor. We try to do uh, different areas of the tissue damage at the nerve, at the brain. So these are scheduled. They're not PRN. Um, they're the correct dose and the correct medication for the correct risk factors. And you can see that it won't let you choose two NSAIDs, you'll only be mutually exclusive. You'll only be able to choose one. So you choose Celebrox, Toradol, Ibuprofen. And again, every drug has risks and you need to know your patient and their risk factors to know if it's appropriate for you to give the medications. But if it is appropriate, then this is a good option to choose those medications where you don't have to go through and set how often to give it, when it expires, the dose to give it, go search for each drug. They're all going to be right in front of you in an order set where you can click, 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 sign, initiate, sign. Um, again, the Tylenol is scheduled. So let's talk about Toradol for a second. 
By the way, Toradol is equally analgesic to 8 milligrams of IV morphine in the studies that are done based on visual analog scale and ERs. And there's a ceiling on the effectiveness of IV Toradol at 10 milligrams. So I utilize 15 milligrams. And the reason I do that instead of 30 is I get less dose-dependent side effects. So for example, some people's kidneys are reliant on the afferent arterial, the prostaglandins in the afferent arterial to maintain GFR. And if you give an NSAID and you take away those prostaglandins, you could develop an ATN. So wouldn't it be nice to give three doses of 15 a day rather than three doses of 90? Because that's half of the milligrams. So you have potentially half of the dose-dependent side effects. I do want you to remember it's very tough on the stomach. There's a 24% risk versus 2% risk for ketorolac versus ibuprofen over baseline. We want to limit its use, and now this order set will expire after three days, so that's not much concern, but keep an eye on the creatinine. And remember that Vioxx was removed from the market, and it belongs to the COX-2 inhibitors. This is uh, not a selective COX inhibitor, but there is some talk that the interplay between prostaglandins, prostacyclins, and thromboxanes could lead to um, potential myocardial events in patients on NSAIDs. It's probably a class effects. Maybe naproxen is the best out of the class, but um, the package insert does say to be cautious in patients with risk factors for CAD. Now, here's a nice study showing that. You know, I always wondered, is Celebrex equally analgesic to ibuprofen? You know, Celebrex is known to give you less stomach upset, less bleeding, um, and be a little easier on the body, but is it as effective? So here is one study to show that it is equally analgesic. Here's another study that it was equally analgesic. No ex difference exists among emergency department patients treated for pain at five hours with 200 or 400 or ibuprofen 600. So in other words, you don't need to use 400 of Celebrex. You can use 200. They're equally analgesic. And if you're worried about the stomach or you just want to take care of the stomach, preventing gastritis and ulcer and bleeding, don't go for the Advil. Go for the Celebrex. Celebrex off, also offers once a day dosing, which is a real benefit. So I will frequently give a 200 milligram Celebrex prior to anesthesia. So in the holding area, I'll see the patient. I'll give 200 milligrams of Celebrex, 975 milligrams because they come 325 pills, so three pills, 975 milligrams of Tylenol. And even sometimes I'll give um, gabapentin 300 as a single dose, preoperative dose. And all of these things, when they wake up from anesthesia, will have a great plasma level. And they'll wake up in less pain and they'll need less opioid in recovery. Now, recovery room costs $1,000 an hour for a patient to be there. So if you can minimize the episode of just nausea and vomiting from utilizing less opioids, you potentially could have tremendous cost savings. Um, now, let's look at gastrointestinal complications. Now, Tortal is in a league of its own. It does have a very tough impact on the stomach. And you can see ibuprofen and Celebrex much lower. So when you can, if you don't need a really strong parenteral opioid, go for the ibuprofen or the Celebrex. So this is relative risk over baseline. So 1.5 to 1 1.8, it's not that high, but 11.5 is. So for me, I'll use an intraoperative parenteral dose of ketorolac and then try to move to oral ibuprofen postoperatively. Now, like we talked about with Toradol, this is a trial that shows what the relative risk of gastrointestinal complications is based on low or high dose of a drug. And you can see, for example, with ibuprofen, that using the lower dose causes much less gastrointestinal complications. But hey, does it work? Well, good thing is that the optimal analgesic dose for ibuprofen is 400 milligrams. So using 400 instead of 800 will drop your risk of gastrointestinal complications, but it will also be effective. And that is important. Now, ketorolac can increase the predisposition towards bleeding because of its effect on thromboxanes and platelets. Um, here's some trials that show in certain surgeries there might be a little increased risk of bleeding like tonsils and breast uh, reductions with drains. But there was a big meta-analysis that showed there was really no increased risk of bleeding. So personally, I take it case by case. I talk to the surgeon. If the field looks dry and bleeding is a not major consequence, i.e. not working on the retina or intracranial, I'll have absolutely no problem giving 15 milligrams of parenteral ketorolac. All right, let's move on to Tylenol. Before I get started, I want to show you that when IV opioids are given, the 
acetaminophen does not get a plasma level. So you really want to give your acetaminophen prior to the case, and you want to give it before the opioid so you get a good plasma level of the drug. But Tylenol by itself, which everyone shrugs their shoulders at because it's over the counter, is very effective. The data is clear. A patient will be twice as likely to report excellent satisfaction versus placebo if they got Tylenol. Their opioid consumption will be cut in half, a third to a half, right? So instead of maybe needing two milligrams of dilaudid in a day, they will only need one. What do you think that will do to the dose-dependent side effects? Tremendously reduced, which will increase patient satisfaction, ambulation, potentially discharge. But the Tylenol cannot be PRN. You need to schedule it. You can give four grams a day. I personally give three, so I give 975 Q8 because I don't want Q6 hour dosing because that means the patient gets woken up while they're sleeping. I'd rather just give it with meals, have three grams in them for the day, and then we have a 30 to 50% opioid reduction. I don't know about you, but if I have a headache, if I take Tylenol, the headache goes away. So it's efficacious. Why are we not using it on every patient, right? So don't use it on severe hepatic impairment. That's obvious, severe septic states, whatever else. But in all comers with pain, you should have a standing order for acetaminophen, 975 TID, and they will have 30 to 50% less opioid consumption. This is just some work showing that scheduling it allows better pain scores. Um, so quick word on Ofermev. I was very excited for Ofermev to come out. I've been very disappointed in Ofermev, so I want to talk a little bit about it. IV Ofermev. So truth be told, if you need a rapid plasma level and, and rapid analgesia, IV Ofermev is better than oral Ofermev. But if you can give an oral agent, um, it will be as effective once it kicks in. So... Um, yeah, maybe if you wanted to give an initial dose because to get rapid analgesia, but after that, it should be oral, not IV. Because a higher plasma level doesn't mean better analgesia. Look at this graph here. If if it's it's theoretical, but if the IV blood level is high and the PO level is not as high, but it's still above the analgesic threshold, then there's no real benefit to having a higher plasma level. And this is laid out in the studies. There is plenty of work you can see on these slides that there was no translation of IV use into a difference in pain versus PL. And it's been studied in multiple specialties. Um, but it does have a role if you cannot use ketorolac and the patient has an NG tube and they can't take oral because it's on suction, they have valve obstruction, or if they um, need rapid analgesia or they're vomiting. Those are all reasons where it might be reasonable to use Ofermet. But remember, we paid eight cents per pill for Tylenol, and we paid twenty-five to sixty dollars for Ofermet. So you have a hundred time more expensive drug, but you have multiple, multiple studies that show no benefit over oral. And this is the most recent study that I've seen. Um, it was in the arthroplasty literature, and it showed that there was no benefit for intravenous Tylenol over PO Tylenol as part of a multimodal approach to pain management after orthopedic arthroplasty surgery. So is IV Tylenol better than PO? Probably not. If the gut works, use it, but consider IV Tylenol in certain situations. Okay, now let's talk about opioids. So again, I spoke earlier about a pendulum. Too much opioids in the 90s and 2000s, and maybe we went too far in the other direction a few years ago. Um, but we have to find a place where we can give effective, appropriately prescribed, appropriate dose, appropriate duration, appropriate goals, patient goals for opioids. So this is my pain management protocol, and your choices will be oxycodone or tramadol for PO, and dilaudid or morphine for IV. Now, I am not a tramadol fan. It's a very dirty drug. It's a drug with a lot of side effects. It's a drug with addiction potential. Um, but I noticed it was utilized uh, inappropriately at times, given in too high of doses to um, wrong types of patients. So I decided to include it since it does have a high amount of use in the facility. Now let's talk about oxycodone. Now there was a time when we would give combination product like Percocet. I want you to eliminate Percocet from your armamentarium. Do not prescribe combination drugs as advised by the CDC anymore. You want scheduled Tylenol and you want PRN oxycodone for severe breakthrough. 
So pain score, 0 to 10. A 4 does not need oxycodone. A 5 does not need oxycodone. A 7, if you took your Tylenol and your Advil and you're a 7, maybe it's reasonable to take one. So that's how we want to advise our patients. We want to let them know when to appropriately use the appropriate dose for the effective duration amount of opioid. So we used to write two Percocets. We're getting away from that because five milligrams. So what is Percocet? It's oxycodone and acetaminophen. So rather than prescribe Percocet, you can prescribe oxycodone, five milligrams. Now, when we used to give two, milli two tabs of Percocet, um, we're trying to minimize that dose. So we want to bring that pain score from a seven to a four. We're not trying to get to zero because the less dose we give, the less euphoria you get and potentially the less addiction down the road. Now, did you know that oxycodone comes as a liquid? So we could give that frail elderly grandma, if we choose frail elderly on the order set, the option for oxycodone will be 2.5 milligram suspension. So rather than give a five milligram dose that may make them delirious, may make them fall out of bed, may make them have a dose dependent side effect, we can give them a dose that will bring their pain for from a seven to a four, without having them have a bad outcome. Now for diluted, I don't know if you know the conversion from morphine to diluted, but um, 0.5 of diluted is like three and a half of morphine. And that's a very reasonable place to start for parenteral analgesia. Three and a half of morphine should bring your pain score down from a seven to a four, and that is our goal. Now, I'm sure you've seen the 2 milligram dilaudid order before. Well, would you ever write for 14 milligrams of morphine? Because the equally analgesic dose to 2 milligrams of dilaudid is 14 milligrams of morphine. Now, you may have gone away with it for many years, but you have to remember, picture that obstructive sleep apnea patient who stops breathing 60 times an hour. And then a nurse comes in, gives 2 milligrams of IV dilaudid, and leaves the room. 15 minutes later, there's a code. And we've all seen this happen at all the facilities we worked at, and it's time for it to stop. If you give 0 0.5 milligrams, you're much less likely to have that event occur. You can see grandma might get 0.3 milligrams in the protocol. So 0.3 milligrams is like 2 morphine, a perfect place to start for a frail elderly person. Now, OxyContin, um, I really think it should be used rarely. The advice from the CDC is to get away from extended release opioids, but they do have a role in cancer pain. So it is available, but we really do not want to start. Why? Because you're going to start 10, and they're going to move to 20 and 30. And before you know it, the patient is on 30 TID of OxyContin, and they're no better off. They're not in a good place. They're not back to work. They still have pain. But now they have central sensitization. Now if they stub their toe, they cry it's so painful because they have wind-up. They have hyperexcitability. Opioids cause increased pain over time. I always know when I start an IV who's on chronic opioids because it's basically like I hit them with a sledgehammer. So we want to minimize the use of the extended release to prevent that escalation of 50 morphine equivalents per day kind of thing. All right, so what are some pearls? We want short courses. We want a three-day course for acute pain when we when we use it. We try not to use it. We might say, listen, you're going to have some pain. You have to heal. You have an injury. You have to heal. You're going to have some discomfort. Take a gram of Tylenol. Take two Advil three times a day. Put some ice on it. Let's get through it. Um, but if you're going to use an opioid, don't write for five or seven days anymore. Do for three days. Remembering that four doses causes dependency in lab rats. Lowest effective dose. Get away from the two Percocets and do five of oxycodone rather than two Percocets, which would be 10. Eliminate the combination drugs and define your treatment goals. Say, I can't get rid of your pain. I want to decrease your pain by 50%. That's our goal, and I want to get you off opioids. If you don't do this, it will turn into an indefinite treatment with opioids. So we want to say, we, our goal is to get you through this very acute phase, but I have to get you off it before you get addicted. Be blunt before you get addicted and you're on it for life. Because the truth is, at the end of a year, you will have more pain if you're on it than if you're not. And that's evidence-based. Evidence does not suggest that IV is better than PO. So just because the patient's in the hospital does not mean you need to write for IV diluted. You can write 5 of oxycodone. A better than oxycodone is MSIR. So MSIR gives you less of the euphoria, 
it's less palatable by the patient. And so 7.5 of MSIR is a good alternative to 5 of oxycodone. All right, so let's talk about opioids and how to compare them, you know, different types of opioids potency-wise. So typically we talk about morphine IV, 10 milligrams, as being the gold standard. And when we compare different opioids, we talk about how many milligrams is equal to that 10 milligrams. So for example, morphine orally, which is MSIR or MS Contin, 30 milligrams is equipotent to 10 milligrams of IV morphine. Vicodin is also 30 milligrams is equipotent to 30 milligrams of PO morphine or 10 milligrams of IV morphine. Oxycodone, however, is more potent and 20 milligrams of oxycodone is equal to 30 milligrams of PO MS Contin, MSIR, hydrocodone, Vicodin. So we compare oxycodone to be a little more potent when talking about uh, equipotency. Now, with IV, 10 milligrams of IV dilaud is equal to 1.5 of IV, I'm sorry, 10 milligrams of IV morphine is equal to 1.5 of IV dilaud, or 100 milligrams of Demerol, or 100 micrograms of fentanyl. So morphine is much less potent than the 100 micrograms of fentanyl, which is more potent. And when we convert a patient from one class to the other, we usually use these to make that decision and then cut it in half just to be safe. All right, let's talk about topical medicine. So what are they all about? Diclofenac gel, Voltaren gel, is actually now very inexpensive. It's no longer $40 a tube. And patients will call you for refills because it works. And what they found is that you will get a 100% drug level in the tissue when you rub it on your skin. So you rub it over your knee, you'll get a 100% drug level that you would get if you took the drug orally. But you only get a 5 to 10% drug level in the blood. So you don't have to worry about those systemic effects, but you do get a very high concentration in the tissues in question. So diclofenac gel is a great way for you to give an NSAID to someone who you'd normally be worried about their stomach, etc. And so this protocol will have diclofenac gel there for you. It will say how to prescribe it. All you do is click the box and sign it. Same thing with lidocaine patches. You might, you might forget how often to give them, how many you can use. And so all those instructions are in the order set. Now the analgesic balm is a menthol-based product like Icy Hot or Bengay. And you should be using it on any one of your patients who have musculoskeletal pain. It works with the gate theory. So your spinal cord gets all these signals from the menthol sensation and it overrides the sensation of the A delta pain fibers that are coming in or the C unmyelinated pain fibers coming in. And so the gate theory allows you to feel the menthol sensation and not the pain. Very effective and very inexpensive. Now, neuropathic pain, uh, as we know, gabapentinoids play a role, and so the dosing for you is in here in case you forget, hey, how much do I use in a dialysis patient? How much would I use in a sleep apnea patient? Um, remember that these drugs can cause increased sedation, especially combined with other drugs, so you want to start low and go slow and be very cautious in the frail elderly who can get confused in up to 30% of the time, and sedation... I'm sorry, uh, confusion is 5% of the time um, at the 150 BID pregabalin dose, which you should not be using up front. Um, and 30% um, of the time you get sedation, though. So confusion is a little less common, but be very uh, aware of the side effects of these medications. Um, but it will give you a guide. You need to know the drug. You need to understand the drug, but it will give you a guide to dosing. And then I don't use the muscle relaxants, but I wanted the dosing to be appropriate and I didn't want sleep apnea patients to get these drugs, so we put them in the protocol. So if you do use them, then you'll know the appropriate dose, interval, and the types of patient to use them in. Now the Joint Commission put a focus on non-pharmacologic pain treatments as well. And so that brings up the concept of pain versus suffering. You know, the mantra, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. For example, I'll start an IV on two patients. One patient won't flinch, and the other one will cry and scream like I hit them with a the sledgehammer. Both patients had the same pain. But one patient, the second one, suffered more. 
So if we can teach our patients that they will have some inevitable discomfort, but they don't need to lament and suffer, they may have a better experience and achieve their goal better. So for example, patients coming for a gastric sleeve, I'll have a discussion with them. Hey, um, you're going to get this procedure. We're going to do it minimally invasively through lapros laparoscopy. We're going to do all kinds of things to minimize your pain, but your body will sense some discomfort, but try not to internalize it and suffer. Put your mind in other places. Focus on things like um, guided imagery or deep breathing or distraction techniques such as coloring or listening to music, but don't stare at the incision and feel pain and suffer. But in our order set, there are some non-pharmacologic options like a physical therapy consult. Um, you can add an ice pack. You can um, talk about holistic care like um, guided imagery, free soul meditation. You know, these things take your mind off of the pain. And then there's biofeedback available where they will put sensors on your body to help realize the second you start to have um, increased anxiety, which will lead to increased pain and allow you to deal with those thoughts. And um, things like acupuncture, compression, passive motion, strengthening, stretching, heat and ice, exercise, yoga, aqua aerobics, guided imagery, deep breathing, mindfulness-based stress stress, they work. If you sit in bed all day and take opiates, you will get worse. If you get moving, you will get better. So we have to tell our patients, moderate walking, 20 minutes a day. It will drop their risk of depression by 20%, almost equally efficacious to an SSRI. Got to get moving. So CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, is um, a way to recognize automatic negative thoughts and and address them. So if you see a patient who has maladaptive coping mechanisms like fear avoidance of, of um, activities or if they're catastrophizing, you want to um, redirect them into CBT so they can get the psychotherapeutic approach of um, recognizing the negative thoughts that appear and then dealing with them um, to prevent them from getting out of control. I'm very happy to report I talked to the state today and our PDMP, the Phys Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, will be in our Cerner in no time. So any patient you have on the screen, you'll be able to click on it and get a full report to show there's a patient getting multiple prescriptions um, throughout the region. Um, now we ask that you don't just like write off the patient and never talk to them again. You want to talk to them. You want to listen to them. You want to hear their story. You want to come up with a plan. Maybe you want to call the other clinicians involved. Um, you know, there's no requirement for you to act on the information you receive. It won't be held against you, but it's good to know. And um, if there is an opioid use disorder, you want to talk to them about treatment options, which I'll talk about. I'll talk about it now. So the management of opioid use disorder. So um, an opioid use disorder is where you continue use despite harm, increasing dosing, withdrawing, and cravings. And so we have a patient in-house, and they use 10 bags of heroin a day, and all of a sudden they have cholelithiasis, and once they're in the hospital, they start to withdraw. They either use while they're here or they go AMA. So buprenorphine is a way where we can give this partial mu agonist. What does that mean? So methadone is a full agonist. Morphine is a full agonist. This binds the side of the mu receptor, and it allows it to not get the euphoria. But it also prevents the withdrawal. So if you prevent the withdrawal, we can finish treating that patient. So you want to prevent the withdrawal. You want to prevent the euphoria. Also get a, a respiratory depression ceiling, which is great. So this will reduce cravings. It will prevent relapse. It will prevent o OD. Um, and anyone with a DA can order it while they're in the hospital. So if the patient's admitted for medical reasons and goes into withdrawal, we should be giving them buprenorphine. So how do we do it? Well, if you're on heroin and you give buprenorphine while you're high, you will displace all the heroin off your mu receptors and you will withdraw. And the patient will never talk to you again and never use Suboxone again. So you have to wait until they start to withdraw to give the first dose of buprenorphine. So you, we use the COW score. Clinical opioid withdrawal scale, Google it. If the score is 9, you may give the buprenorphine. Before 9, you want to wait until it hits a 9. So if it's 9, we give 8 milligrams, sublingual. 45 minutes later, we look at them. If it's less than 9, we're done. Give 8 twice a day. 45 minutes later, it's still above 9, give another 8. 
and so on. And remember, buprenorphine comes in suboxone. That's where it's mixed with naloxone, so you can't shoot it. But in the hospital, we could just use subutex because we're not worried about diversion here. Um, Sublocate, I don't know much about, but apparently it's a monthly injection. But buca may be coming down the pipe for pain. It's available now, and maybe we won't give a full agonist like oxycodone that has very high risk for addiction. Maybe we'll give a partial agonist, get some pain control, get a ceiling on respiratory depression, but also prevent addiction. That's all theoretical, and we're waiting for that data to really metab um, accrue. And Buprenex is the IVIM version. Um, but remember, if we start induce, we call it inducing, induce the suboxone while the patient is here. We can't just discharge them, let them run out and start withdrawing and need heroin. So we have to have a plan. So if you know a friend that prescribes suboxone, um, I know there's several clinicians here, just say, hey, can, can you see this patient? Give them a script, and when they leave here, they'll follow up with you. Or you can get in touch with the University of Behavioral Health Care at Newark Center. The phone number is here. And they, if you hit number one, you'll get a televisit, um, and you'll they do suboxone. They also do housing and, and mental illness uh, counseling. But um, And I'm hoping here at East Orange General Hospital we'll be offering these services as we develop our behavioral health uh, programs. All right, so real brief, um, the CDC says for long-term chronic pain management, we want to focus on non-pharmacologic. Get them moving. Get them to therapy. Get them doing heat. Get them doing stretching. Get them doing whatever it takes that's um, going to help them get moving. We want to focus on non-pharmacologic. We want to schedule the Tylenol. We want to use appropriate doses in the right patients of the non-steroidals. Maybe you want to start um, neuropathic medicine like uh, gabapentin. Maybe you want to start duoxetine, right? Cymbalta, 30 for the first week, 60 after that. It's great for generalized anxiety disorder. It's great for depression, but it really helps chronic pain, especially neuropathy, knee pain, and back pain. If you start therapy, come up with goals. Say, listen, I want to help you through this, but we're going to get you off this, and we're going to reassess sh shortly. Um, discuss the benefits that are realistic. Say, hey, maybe we can't re get rid of your pain. Let's reduce it in half. Let's try other things. Um, use immediate release opioids. Don't use long acting. Use the lowest effective dose. If your MMEs are above 50 to 90, so the morphine milligram equivalents per day is above 50, consider a Narcan prescription. Talk to them about risk and try to titrate them down, maybe 10% per week. Get them on less because the more they're on, they're not going to do better. They're going to have more disability, more days away from work, and more pain, believe it or not. Reevaluate harms, evaluate risk factors for opioid related harms. Um, we want to use the PDMP to so, uh, so log into that and see if they're getting multiple prescriptions. Consider urine drug testing in your long term patients to make sure that they're following the rules. And avoid prescribing opioid pain medications with benzodiazepines because there's been a lot of deaths in patients on coexistent benzodiazepines with opioids. That's been a big portion of the deaths really advising against co-prescribing benzodiazepines and opioids. And if you recognize opioid use disorder, consider getting them some help with buprenorphine. Even if someone's just on OxyContin 30 TID for years, maybe can talk to them about getting them converted over to Suboxone and change their life. It will take away the withdrawal. It will give them partial analgesia and it will get them on the road to recovery. Um, real quick, the MME, if you want to, you know, what they found is if your morphine milligram equivalents are greater than 50 per day, you had two times the risk uh, if they were less than 20 versus if they were less than 20. And certainly 90 is even higher risk. So you basically take, for example, oxycodone, 1.5 times the total milligram dose, and that's your daily MME. And if it's greater than 50, try to taper it down, talk to them about Nargan, talk to them about what's going on. All right, and remember that um, opioids can cause respiratory depression and can lead to sleep apnea issues. So we want our patients to be serially assessed by the nurses with a, a sedation scale and also a respiratory assessment. So the respiratory assessment is, hey, this is a patient's chest rising. Is their color good? Are they ventilating well? Is their air coming out? Are they snoring? Are they too sleepy? Are they easily aroused? These are all things you want to keep an eye on. And we also use what's called the Becerra Opioid Induced Sedation Scale. So that's a 1, 2, and 3, and 4. I'm a 1 right now. 
A two is slightly drowsy, but easily aroused. Maybe you watching the lecture. So if I call your name, you perk right up and you are wide awake. So a one or two can actually get the next dose of medication. They can stay on the dose that they were prescribed. But if you're a three, which means you fall asleep while I'm talking to you, like I say, hey, how you doing? Oh my God, I'm in so much pain. That's a three. That patient should have their dose lowered. You should stay with the patient till they're a two. Maybe consider an RRT to get them some Narcan. Maybe um, um, keep a close eye on them until they're back in the two range. Um, and so that's called recognizing advancing levels of sedation. And so we want our nurses to also, um, before they dose the medication, make sure the patient's a one or a two, and then reevaluate after dosing to make sure they're still a one or two. And if not, maybe raise the head of the bed and wake them up, call an RRT, um, change the dose so it doesn't happen again on the next shift. All right, it was a real pleasure to discuss this, and I would um, enjoy if any of you reached out to me to discuss further any comments that you have or help that you need in the field. It was great to see you all. Have a great night.